In this time of a pandemic, we are all deluged, it seems, with dozens of unanswerable questions, each one competing for our limited attention and capacity to focus. How long will this last? How are we gonna make it financially? How do I keep myself safe? How do we live with this kind of uncertainty? As we vacillate between one question or another, whichever happens to be working us over at any particular moment, there might in fact be one question that lies beneath all the others. What matters? I think what matters is the thing right in front of us this very moment. I remember in the early 80s reading a magazine interview with Rosalind Carter. This would have been not long after she and Jimmy had moved out of the White House back to their home in Plains, Georgia. At the time of the interview, she was busily engaged in laying a new brick footpath up to the front stoop of their house. She commented to the interviewer how astonishing it was to reflect that very few months earlier, she and Jimmy had been living in the White House, hosting steak dinners, Camp David Peace Accord, all of that. And now the most important thing in the world is that these bricks are straight. And it matters, she said. Though I was such a young man, the idea struck me as something so profound. It's almost Zen-like, isn't it? Around the same time, I remember taking some kind of self-development seminar or another. After all, it was the 80s, in which we were given the task of writing our own epitaph. Now, if you've never tried it, it can be a daunting task, but also illuminating. It becomes even more daunting when we have to do it for real. My mom died a year ago, April. There's only so much room on those little bronze plaques. Which few words are you gonna choose to summarize, to encapsulate an entire human life? What I chose for myself in my 20s was, he was moved by life. I think what matters is really quite fluid and changeable over the course of a lifetime, maybe even over the course of an afternoon. What mattered to me at 25 is not what mattered to me at 45, which bears little resemblance to what matters to me today at 65. I think in the first half of life, we're so busy accomplishing our goals, achieving something, perhaps trying to achieve success, as if we have the vaguest idea what that really means. Second half of life, I think, is a different story. But one inescapable truth for all but precious few of us is that a couple generations from now, no one will know or remember or care that you even walk the earth. So given that reality, what matters? I have to come back to Rosalind Carter, that the bricks are straight. And yes, while I'm focusing on this brick that's in front of me, I have to be mindful and attuned to all the overwhelming problems that plague our world. But when it comes time for me to take my last breath, what will I say matters then? In my role as an oncology chaplain, I would say I'm sort of in the coming out business. I'm creating a safe space for people to come out to me, to tell me their truth, often their deepest truth and often at the most critical time of their lives, at the end of it. But it's not only a coming out business, it's also a meaning making business because once that truth is out there on the table, how do we contain it? How do we make sense of it? That's part of the gift and exhilaration of doing this work. Every day I get that constant reminder, Michael, pay attention, particularly as I move well into the third act of my life. When I reflect back on Acts 1 and 2, I realize how seldom it was that I was ever focused on the brick in front of me. I always had my eye around the corner to what the next thing is. How does this decision affect that one? What class do I take? What do I major in? What uh, career do I pursue? Which relationships do I nurture to get me closer to wherever it is I think I want to go? The place that I think will make me happy. And of course, that's still kind of true in a way, but maybe with a little less urgency, but maybe with even more, because at this stage of my life, the big what's next for me now is the home stretch, the final reckoning. So when it comes time to take my last breath, what will I say matters then? 
Of course, there are as many answers to that question as there are people on the planet, but still I hear common answers from folks who wrestle with that very question when deciding if they're going to sign up for guaranteed intense suffering with the next chemo, drug trial, or surgery. What is it that makes life worth fighting for? Oh, I'd like to see my son graduate high school. I'd like to live long enough to see my daughter get married or my grandchild be born. Still, I find those answers deceptively tidy and simple, seldom revealing the whole story. Many years ago, I worked in the inpatient bone marrow transplant unit at UCLA. Leukemia and lymphoma patients mostly, where most folks spend many weeks in the hospital. And there I met Leon, who was a difficult guy, prickly, not at all likable. In all of his weeks in the hospital, I never saw that he had a single visitor. And he was kind of proud of that. I don't need anybody, he would say. He had his own business and he had a dog who scared the neighbors. Leon identified as an atheist, a secular Jew. He presumed I was religious and a Christian, neither of which are true, but he used to enjoy duking it out with me, philosophically speaking. That was the nature of my spiritual care. We would engage in these deep theological discussions. Once he got his bone marrow transplant, things went south very quickly, and the doctors came in with that awful news. Nothing more we can do. Then his heart began to soften, and then the tears came. But the very next day, the docs came in and said, wait, Leon, we think that you might qualify for this new drug trial coming down the pike. Oh, his spirits went through the roof, mine too. Leon, this is great news. Tell me, what are you going to do with more time if you get it? I eagerly wanted to know. I'd like to finish my invoicing, he said. My heart just sank. In total judgment, I admit, I was not a good chaplain in that moment. I did not ask the next obvious question. Oh, that's interesting. Why are your invoices so important to you? No, I just sat there in su stunned silence. I guess I was hoping he might say, I'd like to walk my dog on the beach one more time, or I'd like to see one more beautiful sunset. I'd like to hear Rhapsody in Blue one more time. No, he said, I'd like to finish my invoicing. That's where he found his meaning. That's what mattered. Marianne, in her 40s, had been living the previous several years with pancreatic cancer, and I walked the last few months of her journey by her side. Not long before she died, I went to see her in the hospital, and she was just fried, absolutely cooked, hooked up to every tube and pump and hose imaginable. I'm done, Michael, ready to let go. But it wasn't an option. You see, her husband and kids, of course, want her to keep fighting. Try the next drug trial, try the next surgery, get a second opinion, a third opinion, a fifth opinion. I can't die having them think for the rest of their lives, I didn't love them enough to keep fighting. What would you like, Marianne, right now, if you could call the shots? Oh, that's easy. Disconnect all of this. I'd want my husband to get in bed with me and hold me and look at that window across my room at the tree across the street and just say, look, at the leaves on that tree. Look at how that one just catches the light and flutters in the breeze. Isn't that beautiful? A God moment, she would call it. Over our months together, she had told me about other God moments in her life, moments that sort of anchored her into life, moments in which not much really happened. The stuff and business of life just fell away leaving space, room for awareness that this moment is enough and it's beautiful. I'd like one more God moment, she said. I met Evelyn on her first day of chemotherapy after having been newly diagnosed with ovarian cancer. She came to see me regularly every couple weeks for the next six years. Though she never wanted to talk about anything of any greater consequence than what she and her husband, Jean, had done the previous weekend. Despite all of my invitation, holding the door open to talk about other deeper themes that are coming down the pike, she never took the bait. I didn't think I was doing much of anything, but she would conclude every visit by just saying, oh, thank you, Michael. I always feel so much better after talking to you. 
I went to see her in the hospital the day before she died. Her husband, Jean, was there, of course. They had been married forever, high school sweethearts, no kids. The Buddhists think it's a good idea to reflect on the sweet memories of life when one is about to make their transition, that it might maybe grease the wheels for the next incarnation. No matter what our beliefs are about such things, it's not a bad idea. So I asked Jean, tell me that story again about how you guys met. I love that story. And he launched into the story and soon enough, Evelyn was getting irritated. She didn't remember. Undaunted, Jean pressed on. Oh, sure you do, honey. Remember we went to that football game and we were in the back seat of the car? No, the memory was gone forever. Jean changed course. Okay, honey, maybe you're just tired. I'll tell you what, Michael and I will go out in the hall and chat a little bit, give you a chance to rest. How about that? No, she said defiantly. I'm not tired. I don't want to rest. I want you both here. I just don't want anybody to talk. I got on one side of the bed and sat down. He sat on the other side. We each held a hand and we just looked at one another holding space. There is absolutely nothing to do or say. Just the awareness of this moment of love. For the rest of my life, that scene has imprinted my heart with what truly sacred space looks like. Perhaps what matters most is what's left when everything we thought had mattered has burned away. So what matters to me today? This conversation matters. Kindness really matters. Friendship, love, being a witness to one another in our lives as they are. Kinship, communion, an old fashioned religious word, but I love the imagery of it, taking it in and digesting our common humanity, our connection to each other, to nature, to the source of life itself, that matters. Sure, I'd like to think when I'm taking my last breath that I'll think I made a difference. I relieved some suffering. I provided some encouragement. I had a blast. I saw the world. I loved hard. But I am not so delusional as to think it was ever anything more than one brick at a time, one conversation at a time. We go through life making countless choices, countless interactions and gestures with one another, tiny little gestures of kindness perhaps. Those might in fact have the farthest reaching impact of anything we ever do. They might in fact be our greatest legacy. Joseph Campbell believes that we are to realize the eternal within to participate with joy in the sorrows of the world. I come back to that again and again, participate with joy in the sorrows of the world. I don't know, maybe it just comes down to being moved by life. So be it, thank you.